So this is story time, and uh, just spoiler alert, uh, um, there are some scary parts to this story. I'll warn you, like as those are coming up, um, but there's also a happy ending to this story. So the name of my talk is We Have a Stone in Our Shoe. And, you know, the basic, you know, the reason for this is, like, if you imagine, like, say you had a stone in your shoe, like this big around, and, you know, you walked around on it uh, for a while, and you went to the dock, and you said to the dock, Doc, my foot hurts. And, you know, the dock might say, oh, you don't really tell me about that. And he might take your foot out and examine your foot and everything and say, yeah, I see some inflammation here. And, you know, it, it, you know, when I touch it, is it painful? And you say, yeah. And then he could give you, like, something like OxyContin or something like that. Uh, and then send you on your way, you know. And, and if you did a randomized clinical trial where you had, like, 100 people with this painful foot disorder, you know, and you gave half of them, you know, OxyContin and the other half of them, uh, uh, you know, you just sent them on their way. I promise you at the end of the month, you know, the next month, that the people, you know, that were taking the OxyContin would have less pain, better mobility, and, you know, a pretty good quality of life, you know. They'd be feeling pretty good compared to these other guys who were just walking around with a stone in their shoe, uh, you know, without, you know, the benefit of narcotic pain medication. But, like, what would the cure be for that? Right? Well, the cure would be Take the stone out of your shoe. Don't take like a pill so that it makes it so that you can tolerate, you know, walking around with a stone in your shoe. And I think we've got a stone in our shoe. Now this talk, in part, uh, has been informed by the incredible opportunity I've had over like about the last five years to uh, hang out with some of the smartest uh, evolutionary biologists on the planet. And so this is David Sloan Wilson up here. David Sloan Wilson's kind of signature uh, idea in evolutionary psychology is this idea that the, the huge adaptive advantage that human beings have is that we cooperate like no other uh, primate on the planet. I know we're used to sort of seeing the pictures of these gorillas and they're all just like all kissing their babies and hanging out eating leaves and like that. And it uh, looks really nice. But if you look at the fruits of human cooperation over time, I mean, we have built uh, empires and ships and things that fly in the air and things that fly above the air. And we have created technologies that allow us to live on like every part of the planet. You know, we can live, you know, a thousand uh, feet below the surface of the ocean. You know, we could live on the moon if we felt like it. No other primate. Uh, even comes close, you know, to the level of cooperation that human beings uh, have exhibited. And it has been like our hugest sort of advantage. We're like the cooperative monkey, you know. That's the kind we are. If human beings out on the savanna, you know, got separated from the rest of the human beings, and that lasted very long, they got eaten. You know, we don't have the claws, we don't have the teeth, we don't have the muscles. There are just lots of animals that are capable of eating us singly. But if you put two or three or four or ten human beings together, we can clobber any animal on the planet. You know, we can hunt them down, we can stalk them, we can trap them, we can avoid them, right? Working together, we can do things that we cannot do by ourselves. Eva Yoblanka um, is... Uh, Polish-born, she lives in Israel, and she is interested uh, in uh, epigenetics. So not just what do the genes do, but what does the environment around the genes do in terms of turning genes on and off. Now, I've always been kind of an Evos guy. When I, the way that I think about psychology is, um, I think uh, in terms of you know, how adaptive people's responding and their patterns of responding is. And, and sometimes uh, patterns of responding are adaptive over a short time frame, but maladaptive over a long time frame. You know, some uh, are a little bit painful over the short time frame, but they work out really great over the long time frame. But my time spent with these folks has sort of driven me to like really think hard about what kind of critter are we? You know, like if you got a new pet, you know, like a dog, and you wanted to know, how do I take care of a dog? The thing that you want to know is, 
Like, what kind of critter is a dog? What do dogs need? Um, and I can tell you there are some things dogs need. Like, for example, and it doesn't mean if we're talking like little tiny, you know, teacup chihuahuas, you know, or Great Danes, these animals uh, evolved in an environment where they walked. Every day they walked, right? And if dogs don't get a chance to walk, they get crazy, right? And it isn't just about the exercise. It's about the walking itself. Um, if dogs are pack animals, they don't live by themselves. And so if dogs don't get like a chance to like hang out with other dogs, right? Um, they get crazy. If they're, and now they'll substitute human beings for their pack. But if you leave them alone a lot, what happens with your dog when you leave them alone? What happens? Huh? You know, like they eat your shoes, you know, or hey, the leg on that couch looks good to me, right? I mean, they get in trouble. They start, you know, foraging, right? And, 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 and in fact, if you deprive dogs of these kind of basic needs, eventually what you'll see happening is, you know, you'll start to see these kind of nervous chewing kinds of behaviors, and you can get all kinds of kind of funny neurotic behaviors going on. And, it, and, and so, you know, this, for me, sort of really launched a, a line of thinking, you know, where I felt like, what kind of creatures are we? What are our basic needs? Um, and and uh, so this talk is deeply informed by that. Now, if you think about, like, what kills uh, in the modern world, right? In the developing world, people are getting killed by, uh, you know, starvation and cholera and things like that, uh, at least in the poorest parts of the developing world. Uh, they're getting killed by bullets and but, but in the developed world, um, most people don't die from that. This is what we're dying from. You know, we're dying from, you know, like gargantuan quantities of refined carbohydrates, and we're dying from, you know, stressing out, and we're, you know, dying from smoking too much and eating too much and the wrong things, and we're stroking out. This is what's killing us in the developing world. By the way, these are the kinds of things that they call lifestyle diseases, right? That, that these are diseases that, I mean, not exclusively, but generally emerge from this kind of really complex combination of uh, lifestyle things that people uh, engage in, right? Like, like there have always been people who were diabetic, but there have never been the number of people who are diabetic that we're seeing right now. I mean, not even close. And children with type 2 diabetes was just like unheard of. I mean, it would happen, but it would be exceedingly rare. And that has changed, right? Now, here's an example on the physical health side of how fast this change is happening. So these are obesity data from the Center for Disease Control. And this is 1985. Now, the white states, we don't have all the data on them. The light states have fewer than 10% of the population uh, is obese in the white states. And those light blue uh, states, uh, or, or the light blue is less than 10%. And the slightly darker blue, it's uh, 10 to 14% obese. So now watch the data start to fill in. And so we're starting to get data on all these states. But notice what's happening here. Do you see it? We're starting to get more of those 10 to 14% states. Uh-oh. Look what just happened. Now we've got states with 15 to 19% obesity. Leading the way here. And 1993. And now we've got all the states. 1994. Now, one of the things I want you to notice here is that the, the thinnest, the leanest states are now here. So that one category, it's gone altogether. And there's 1995, and 1996, and 1997, and now we have a new one, more than 20% of the population. 1998, 1999, 2000, 2001, we've got a new category, more than 25% of the people in the state. 2002, 2003, 2004, 2005, and we have a new one, more than 30%, 2006, 7, 8, 9, 10, 
Do you see this? This is like one of the scary parts. Do you see what's going on here? Now you get all these guys that are out there looking for the genetic causes of obesity. Do you get how this cannot possibly, like this can't be genes. It cannot be a story about genes unless it's a story about genes that are being turned on by something that's going on in the environment. We have a stone in our shoe, right? You know, we didn't just suddenly get like this huge number of obesity genes in the population. Something has changed. By the way, if you're thinking like, you know, oh, grown Mississippi, it turns out there are other ways to collect these data. Um, and it turns out that people from Mississippi are a little more likely to tell the truth about this. And so these data are a little messy, like some states people are like, mm, maybe not being quite as factual about it. And when you use things like doctor records, uh, then it evens out a little bit. But the story is still the same story. It is this story of an exploding epidemic and everything that goes with it, right? Diabetes, you know, just this mass of different uh, problems that come along with it. What about mental health? Like we got a stone in our shoe, something. And I'm not saying what it is exactly right now, but we've got something going on that is driving this epidemic of obesity. How about mental health? I'm just going to show you one statistic here. And there's a scary part coming up. So I just want to, you know, kids, close your eyes. This is 1987. There were 16,200 children in the United States who were on disability for uh, mental uh, uh, disorders, for mental illness. This isn't including intellectual disability. Actually, the number of people on disability for intellectual disabilities has gone down over that uh, period of time. Um, so 1987, 16,000 200 children. Now, what you need to know is these aren't just children who have like a mental health problem. These are children who have a chronic and severe mental health problem because that's the only way that you get on the disability rolls, right? There are like whole companies that, you know, of attorneys who are devoted to helping people get on disability because it is very difficult to navigate that uh, system. Everyone gets turned down initially and you have to like really persist. So these are kids who are really struggling and they are causing a lot of distress and like everybody around them. Uh, so that's 1987, 16,000. Here's 2007. 561,000 children on disability from mental disorders. And in all likeliness, these are children who are like, you know, who will like never go to work, you know, who will never, you know, come someplace like this and like uh, go to college and have the advantages that, you know, all of us have had. We have a stone in our shoe. There is something going on in the environment, you know, in the last, you know, 20 or 30 years that is dramatically, dramatically changing, you know, our health status. And it ain't like cholera is back on the upswing or yellow fever, right? So the question I want to ask is, how much of what we're seeing in terms of psychological struggles and difficulties that people are having, how much of that is like these lifestyle disorders? Now, I'm not saying everything out there you know, that we see in terms of uh, psychological uh, disorders is caused by lifestyle. But it is worth asking how much of it is either caused by or made worse by uh, things that have to do with how we're living. You know, we have a stone in our shoe. Right? Maybe a couple of stones. Okay, maybe a handful of stones. Right? What we're suffering under right now, I think, um, is this kind of overextended idea of the, you know, this medical metaphor that like what's going on uh, is like the equivalent of this like sickness, like, you know, like a staph infection, except that what it probably is, is it's probably some kind of broken brain problem that is itself caused by some kind of broken gene problem. Like you got defective genes. I think that these two ideas um, uh, just piss me off, right? This idea that brains are destiny and that genes are destiny uh, 
uh, just kills me because what they are basically saying is they're saying, oh, you feel like this? Well, that's because you have broken genes. And I'm sorry, there's not really anything you can do about those broken genes, right? You can't go to the genes exchange store, you know, and get like the latest, you know, nice fitting genes or anything like that. You know, you've got the genes that you've got. And the story is told that basically like, and, you know, heaven help you if mom has those genes because, you know, then you're going to be like walking around checking your pulse to see, you know, you know when that, you know, uh, disease, when those broken genes are going to express themselves in you in terms of a broken brain. But do you get our gene pool has not changed that much in 20 years. It just hasn't happened. You know, and I'm here to like tell you that brains are not destiny. Brains change with behavior, right? Like, I can get your brain to change and light up, you know, uh, you know, on the you know highest end kind of uh, you know specs, you know, PET scans, you know, you know, different kinds of brain scanning technologies. I can get your brain to light up all different kinds of ways. Like if I had you do push-ups, your brain would light up in a certain way. And if I had you imagine and picture a mountain stream, your brains would light up in a different way. And if I asked you to add single-digit numbers together, your brains would light up in a different way. You know, if I had you go for a run, they'd light up in a different way. Now, if you sent somebody into the bathroom and you told them that their hands were like contaminated, you know, with germs and that they were going to kill everybody in their life if they carried that contamination away and they spent three or four hours, you know, like, what if I convinced you that there was like Ebola, right? And you spent three or four hours in the bathroom scrubbing and scrubbing, you know, like, well, maybe I should go further than that. Do you suppose your brain would light up in a different way? Do you suppose if you did that for three months or six months or a year, it might light up in a different way? Hell yes! I mean, your brain is like moving all the time. It's in this dance, you know, between brain and behavior and environment. Uh, it's, it's not, you know, some static lump of clay up there. So, you know, is there something different going on in the brains of people who have OCD? Yes. Is that the cause of their problem? We don't know. We don't know. And... Even the differences we do see are not diagnostic. You can't tell the difference between somebody who, you know, is OCD or not OCD by the way their brains light up. No blood test, no brain test, no genetic test. There's actually a genetic test that they have out there that they're, you know, that your doc will be like, uh, you know, you know, might be uh, willing to give you that is say which kind of antidepressant you'll do better on. The, the evidence for the predictive value of that genetic test um, is like nothing. It does not tell you which antidepressant a person will do better on. <clears throat> Why is it FDA approved? Because it tests for what they say it should test for. It tests for that gene. Trouble is that knowing whether you have that gene or not doesn't tell you which antidepressant will work. But it's out there costing people money. Your genes are not just like, you know, in here just like following orders. I mean, you got like, you know, more than 20,000 genes in your body. Most of them at any given moment in any given cell are silenced, right? You know, like, do you suppose all the genes are like, you know, cranking away in your, like, hair cells that are cranking away, uh, in your liver cells that are cranking away, and the cells that line your stomach, right? M most, you know, genes are like, not just like, you know, this way or that way, and they're not even really off and on. There are all kinds of things that alter. Are they off or on? Are they amplified or like dialed down? Are they, you know, silenced in some way? Things like chromatin folding, you know, packaging of DNA around nucleosomes, the ones I've talked about uh, previously, like DNA methylation. This small RNA and micro RNAs, we didn't even know about this stuff until the 90s. And it is clearly in there altering when, whether, how much, how little genes work. Your genes are genes in a context, just like your brains are brains in a context. And they're being re-engineered like right now, right in this moment, they are being re-engineered. Re you know, these are brains in context, genes in context, right? Now, a couple of more stones that I think are in our shoe. Those are like bad ideas, and they're bad for people because they, they cause people to give up on themselves. 
and they cause people to give up on their children, and they cause people to give up on other people that they love, and I'm not okay with it. Are you? Now, here's a couple of other ideas that just piss me off, too. One is that suffering equals disease. So if you're suffering and it doesn't just like go by like really, really fast, then it's probably an indication, you know, like we got to get you to the doc, like, oh no, you know, you got like some kind of psychological fever and like, you know, let's just start dumping the equivalent of antibiotics into you. You know, suffering is not a disease. You know, read your Bible, read your Koran, you know, read your basic Zen text. Every great religion in the world teaches people like how to be with their own suffering. Teaches people that suffering is part of living. Suffering has to do with your connection to this world. Um, I heard a woman on NPR the other day, uh, a couple of years ago. She said, having children is like having your heart on the outside of your body. See, that's a true thing. I've got three children, and I'm telling you, man, there is no pain in this world, you know, that is like even close to the kind of pain you can feel when you see your children like moving towards uh, things that you know will hurt them. And at some point you have to kind of let go of their hands, you know. It's a terrifying and hard thing. Would I trade my daughters away to get rid of that? Hell no. Is it a disease that I feel that terror, that sadness at times? Not in my world. Suffering is not a disease. Suffering is part of living. What we need to teach people is not that their suffering indicates that they have some kind of mental illness that they got from their mom, but teaching people other ways to be with their suffering. Look to your spiritual traditions. Look to your literary traditions. Look to your poetic traditions. They all know this. They all know it and they all teach it. And then this other one, different is a disease. Let me just say, if you saw my first grade report card, I would have been on like ADHD medication in as hot half a second. You know, Kelly won't stay in his chair. Kelly talks all the time, you know, when we want him to and when he, we don't want him to. Kelly doesn't follow instructions. You know, he's moving around the classroom. He's like talking to other kids and disrupting them getting in work. Sound, does, you know, does this sound like the kid lining up for Ritalin at the nurse's station, you know? I mean, there's no doubt about it. You know, the joke's on them, though. Now I get paid for moving around the room all the time, disrupting people and talking nonstop. Ha! Different is not a disease. You know, are some people sadder than others? Are some people more anxious than others? Hell yes! You know, there's a gene called the CERT gene, right? That they think, you know, that in this, uh, in the United States, uh, it's sometimes called the depression gene. But there are other people who think that this CERT gene codes for social sensitivity. So it means I'm more likely to get it, like if something hurts you or makes you sad or makes you happy, then I'm more likely to be responsive to that. And people who carry this, you know, double short uh, CERT gene where they inherited a short allele from mom and a short allele from dad are socially sensitive and therefore more socially vulnerable. Right? They can be helped and hurt more by social interactions. Is that a disease? Right? It turns out that that version that actually um, predicts depression to some extent in the United States predicts well-being in Southeast Asia. So like if you're in a really collectivist culture, guess what? If you're really sensitive to like how everybody's doing around you, you do better. Different is not the same as a disease. If it's a disease, show me the disease. Show me the broken part. Show me the pathogen. Don't just, you don't just get to call it a disease. Now sometimes, you know, when I talk about this stuff, you know, this, this thing like if you don't like look like all the other ones, you know, like that you're, you know, diseased and different. Now some people say, you know, well, you know, do you, uh, do you just not believe in, you know, mental illness, you know, or something like that. Uh, well, you know, these are people who like, or, or you not care, or you some kind of academic ivory tower, you know, yada, yada. You know, these people do not know me, and they do not know my history. I have a lot of flaws, but not caring about people is not one of them. You know, this different one that we're so quick to call a disease, you know, uh, I know about that, right? Some people, sometimes people say, I don't get it, that I don't understand, like, the real world. Well, let me just, like, tell you, I am that guy. 
I am that guy. I spent the first 30 years of my life walking around thinking that I was broken. You know, between the ages of about 14, 13, 14, and 30 years old, I thought I was broken. I thought that I was not made for this world, that you all were strong and smart and capable, and that I was broken. And I did everything I could to make that brokenness go away, you know, to push it down. And, and you know, and that's, you know, that's what it looked like. It looked like that, like anything, anything to, like, make that sadness go away. 1985, one month in a locked psychiatric facility, followed by a month uh, in a drug rehab facility. Right? So anybody who says, oh, you know, you know, you just don't understand the depth of the problem, I just say, you know, piss off. You know, you don't understand me. Right? Just because something is killing people does not mean that they're broken. Right? If I started beating my head against the table, it eventually would kill me. But that doesn't mean I'm broken. It means I'm doing something that is hurting me. I think we are, as a culture, doing things that are hurting people. And, and, and a couple of those stones are different as a disease and suffering you know, uh, equals disease. Now, as I said, you know, you know, this is like this evolutionary stuff has just been getting under my skin and I've been thinking about what kind of critters are we? What do we need? And this time, it's personal. See, I told you, like, I think people do carry genetic risks for different kinds of struggles and difficulties. And I think I'm probably one of those guys, right? And so, you know, a place to start, the one I'd suggest is, what if we think about what kind of creatures are we and we give ourselves the best chance, you know, to thrive and to do well. So this is my personal practice. Uh, you can find it on my Tumblr blog. I'll send that out to you if you'd like to take a look at it. There are just seven practices, you know, like, like the care and feeding of a human being. Like, what if you took care of yourself in the same way that you would take care of your, you know, your beloved Fido, you know? Uh, or like if you had a brother or a sister and you wanted to really care for him, what would that involve? What would that look like? And so these are my practices. And um, I offer them uh, free of charge. First, minimize exposure to toxins. Uh, 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 and I mean both social and chemical toxins, right? So. A good place to start in thinking about this is to think about the things we use to model disease, right? So if you look at animal models of disease and you see, here's the thing you can do to animals that makes them crazy or makes them sick, just don't do those things, right? I mean, wouldn't that make sense? You know, like if you have a way to reliably make animals depressed or make them anxious or make them psychotic, then you'd want to stay away from those things or at least minimize your exposure to them, right? Doesn't that make sense? So how about if we want to model schizophrenia? Well, give them ketamine, also called Special K, you know, which is a club drug not massively distant from the drug, um, uh, you know, ecstasy. It's like one of these you know, uh, amphetamine variants, and in fact, amphetamines and PCP are ways that we model psychosis. Like, you dose animals up with these things, and you'll get them doing all kinds of things that are, like, uh, bad. By the way, in humans, drugs used to treat psychosis, although some people do very well on these drugs, these drugs used over long periods of time have the potential, I'm not saying that they always will, but they have the potential cause neurological changes that cause hypersensitivity to the very neurotransmitters that are implicated uh, in the uh, disorder that you're treating. So I'm not saying don't use them, of course, because some people clearly do very well on these drugs, but, but we should use them with caution, and we should use them for as short a period of time as uh, possible, and there's nice data coming out suggesting that that's you know, a real possibility. You see what I'm saying? Minimize exposure. Now, what about modeling depression and anxiety? Well, if you want to model depression and anxiety in animals, you do things like social stressors. So you like isolate animals that want to be together. You isolate them from other animals. And you can get things that look like depression and anxiety. You can uh, take them away from their parents. 
you know, isolate them from that kind of parental attention. And that will model you know, some of the things that you know, look like depression and anxiety. You can do this social defeat. So um, like if you put a rat in a rat colony, then, you know, there's a kind of struggle at first to see, you know, who's the king rat and who's the, you know, like, you know, the little guys. So if we take this rat and we put him in this colony, he goes through that stressor. And the next day we move and put him in this colony. And, it, and the same thing happens again. And the next day we take him over here and put him in this colony. Well, guess what? You can produce things that look like anxiety and depression by doing that, you know, to, uh, to these animals. Unpredictable physical stressors like shock or cold temperature will produce this neonatal exposure. So if you expose baby um, rats to clomipramine, you can produce in the adult rats something that looks like depression. Clomipramine is itself an antidepressant medication. Again, I'm not saying we shouldn't use these. For some people, they are clearly successful. But for some, they aren't, and we'd want to use them with caution and over the shortest period of time as possible. And we would want to be really cautious before we start giving them to children who are developing. Same story as with the um, uh, drugs uh, for treating psychosis. Now this right here, this is a little group of um, mice and these um, mice carry what's called the agouti gene. And the agouti gene is a gene that codes for um, storing energy in fat. So if you feed these agouti mice, they tend to take that energy. Um, see, it isn't just like a calorie is a calorie. Like if you eat a certain number of calories, depending on your metabolism, you might store it in fat. Uh, you might just expend it uh, uh, energetically. Um, and these little mice, when you see the expression of that agouti gene, will store energy and fat. Even if you like starve them, they'll actually start scavenging muscle tissue to store in fat. So they'll actually lose muscle mass before they'll stop storing energy uh, in, in fat. It's a fascinating thing. What the other thing this agouti gene codes for is this yellow uh, coloring. And so when you get the full expression of this agouti gene, you'll get that bright yellow coloring. But depending on the methylation of that gene, you can get these mice that are like these little brown, slim mice that just look like all the other mice. Now, if you let these mice grow up on exactly the same diet, that one there on the left and that one there on the right will look really, really different uh, than each other. Now, this picture is you know, two of these mice that carry the agouti gene, one of them's mother was exposed to BPA. Have you seen the bottles that say BPA free? Right? So BPA is found in all kinds of, not all kinds, but many plastic bottles, unless they say BPA free. Um, and this mouse's mother was exposed to BPA um, in pregnancy. And those babies come out with this full expression of the agouti gene. This mouse's mother had the same genetic code, but not exposed to this toxin. And the same genes are, go unexpressed. And this one, you can feed it all you want, and it'll grow up, and it'll look just like that slim little brown mouse there. Same genes, different context. One exposure to a uh, toxin, one not exposed to a toxin. You also see this if you expose the baby mice to this, like while mom is pregnant um, and while they're lactating, uh, what you'll see in the baby mice looks like depression and anxiety symptoms. So exposure to this produces that in these lab. Uh, now, you could think about, well, what does that have to do with humans? You know, what about us? Are we at risk? And in fact, like if you look at places like uh, prevention news, uh, places like that, what you find is that there are some indications. Like if you go into certain populations of people with a lot of difficulties, you can predict some things like ADHD and like that by BPA levels. Now, I don't, you know, uh, you know the kinds of things we, there are correlations. Now, we don't know that these are causes. You know, it could be that 
people with high levels of BPA are exposed to other kinds of you know, similar environmental events. But there are correlations with anxiety, with hyperactivity, with depression, with ag aggression. Where are you exposed to it? Well, plastic bottles, particularly the ones with that number seven on the bottom of it. You know those thermal receipts you get at the, uh, you know, when you like, you know, go out to a restaurant? Uh, a lot of those thermal receipts are loaded with BPA. They spray it on the inside of cans and outside of cans so that they look all pretty and shiny. Experts suggest, you know, there are some things in, in now, m most experts agree right now that while there's some cause for concern that there's probably minimal risk in sort of casual exposure uh, to small amounts of BPA. However, you can no longer put it in like little kids sippy cups and you can't do baby bottles like with BPA plastic. The best advice right now is don't heat things in plastic bottles, don't reuse drink bottles, choose stainless steel or glass. Those receipts, if you don't like need it for your taxes, just like leave it on the table, you know. Uh, if you touch it, wash, wash your hands. Not like OCD, but you know, it, it's a matter of lessening your exposure to toxins. And just generally, minimize exposure to alcohol, to drugs, to tobacco to unnecessary medications. Do I need this medication? You know, like, the first thing people do if, like, they see somebody with a fever is, like, give them something to reduce the fever. Did you know that those are called antipyretic drugs? Did you know that if you randomize people to either get anti-fever drugs or no anti-fever drugs, that the ones that get the drugs that reduce fever stay sick longer? They actually cause you to stay sick because your fever is... Typically, not always, if it gets high enough, it's dangerous, but typically it's not dangerous. It's your body creating a hostile environment for those, you know, bugs that are inside of you, right? And that fever actually causes you to get well sooner. Now, I'm not saying suffer a, a dangerous fever, of course, but we're so quick to expose ourselves. Uh, to different things uh, unnecessarily. Things like solvents and fuels, it's, you know, these are, we're not made to like, you know, and like when I was a kid, I worked as a mechanic, and I mean, I had like carburetor cleaner and diesel fuel, and you know, I'm just like, oh man, it's a wonder I survived any of it. Do you know, just do what you can to minimize toxins. Like there's something you can do about this. You know, just small things that you can do. You know, how about like social toxins? Think about, you know, the animal models. You know, you know, stay away from people who are like, you know, hostile and, and toxic and mean. You know, spend your time around people, you know, who are uh, kinder and who are like doing things in their lives that are, uh, you know, not like making the people around them sick. And I recognize that sometimes there's no choice in this. Sometimes you've got to spend, you know, you got like maybe somebody in your family or you've got, you know, a boss or a coworker. But, you know, we can always minimize these things. Just damp them down a little bit. Find ways, you know, to sort of lessen that just a bit. And maybe if we spend time in a toxic environment, we make really, really sure that we spend time with some friends, you know, in an environment that cares about us. These things are demonstrated scientifically to moderate the impact of these kinds of things. You know, these kinds of um, social toxins. Next one, eat real food, right? A good, you know, what you eat and when you eat will change how you sleep. And as you'll see later, how you sleep changes how you function. I mean, good nutrition, you know, you'll be smarter. You'll do better on tests. You know, like if you're jamming in there, you know, into the, you know, finals week or something like that, and you're eating crap, you know, I mean, the data is just crystal clear that eating crap, you know, produces uh, crap thinking. You know, it, it screws with attention. Uh, it screws with uh, memory. I mean, everything that you want in finals week, this is the enemy of that. Bad nutrition is the enemy of that. You know, if you look at like really direct advice, 
you know, this is what they say for ADHD. Make sure these kids get high protein snacks. Like in the morning, give them high protein. You know, in the afternoon when they come home from school, you know, hit them with the high protein snacks. N reduce simple sugars, refined carbohydrates. You know, that is the last thing that they need. These things have demonstrated effects on attention, uh, you know, impulse control, all kinds of, you know, psychological functions. More complex carbs, more omega-3 fatty acids. What about if we look at something like depression? Well, it turns out that if you look at depression, you see, you know, uh, like if you know what people eat, you know something about their risk for depression. Things like high saturated fats, high refined carbohydrates, low amounts of omega-3, so high omega-6 versus omega-3 fatty acids. Um, omega, by the way, omega-3 supplementation, has, there's actually some indication if it's the right array of omega-3s. It's a complex story, but like fish oil supplementation seems to have like nice mood benefits and anxiety and depression. These are small things. You could do this. You could do this like today. Three grams of fish oil, you know. It's that simple. There's an interesting relationship uh, between metabolic syndrome, that's this like storing fat centrally, chronic, um, central, uh, uh, this uh, inflammatory processes between metabolic syndrome, diabetes, and depression. There's like some kind of really interesting mix that is suggestive of this, you know, sort of idea that maybe what we're seeing is, you know, uh, the psychological impact of these kind of lifestyle problems. Now this is crazy. Like Dr. Sefka is going to have to stop being a brain scientist and he's going to have to be a brain gut scientist. He'll have to get a little stomach to put in a jar up in his office, you know, because it turns out, you know, that, um, that something like, is, uh, this is, the gut is really your second brain. Greenblatt says, there are more neurons in the GI tract than anywhere else in your body except for your brain. And guess what? Those, all those neurons, as a matter of fact, 90% of the serotonin in your body is in your gut, not in your brain, right? And they're not alone down there. Turns out we have like 100 trillion microbes that are like living uh, in our uh, gut. And that those microbes are in interaction with immune function and with uh, uh, this neurological function, and there's like this rich communication that's going on between microbes and your gut, and your gut and your brain, and you can, the evidence is really just starting to take off in this area. So you're seeing things like, there was a proof of concept study recently where they had women eat uh, um, basically yogurt twice a day, and I don't mean like that, yo, you know, like the yo play crap that's, you know, like 50% sugar and refined carbohydrates and, you know, 50% yogurt, if it has that much yogurt. And I mean the yogurt, like if you look at the label and it says the ingredients are yogurt, that's what I'm talking about, right? Milk products, yogurt cultures, that's it, right? So twice a day they had women do this for a month. They saw differences in uh, brain scan reactivity, looking at different kinds of uh, pictures. They saw differences in cognitive functioning one month, twice a day. I mean, it's yogurt, you know, it will cost you a dollar, you know, it's, it's available, we can do this. Um, there's some studies where you look at like um, obese and non-obese mice and you can take the gut microbes out of the, um, this is kind of gross, fecal transplanting, has anybody heard of this fecal transplanting? I know, it's kind of gross. You take the gut microbes out of the skinny mice and you put them in the obese mice and they slim down. You take anxious mice and calm mice, and you take the gut microbes out of the calm mice, and you put them in the anxious mice, and they calm down. Now, is that crazy? We're talking the microbes that live in our stomach have, you know, an intimate connection with our emotional and cognitive life. I am, like, mad for gut health. Have you seen that, like, bottle that Charlie, you know, takes upstairs uh, each day? That's, like, my bottle of kefir. I brew that stuff at home. Yeah, baby, I am taking care of my gut health. That's what I'm talking about. 
this guy is fascinating. And some things are the enemy of gut health. So this guy, he's up in uh, New York. He brings people in. He feeds them a McDonald's breakfast, a great big McDonald's breakfast, right? Within 15 minutes, you see the central inflammatory process you know, happen in these people. So he's tracking all this metabolic kinds of stuff. It lasts for like five hours, right? So you get this central inflammation. Remember that there's a connection to depression, a connection to metabolic syndrome, a connection to diabetes, right? Five hours just in time for, you know, a fast food, you know, lunch. And, you know, you're good to go for the whole day. You could have, you keep that chronic inflammation going, you know, constantly. Well, it turns out that some of these uh, foods uh, are also really bad for your gut microbes, and it kills some of them off, and you get this imbalance of gut microbes, which is connected to all kinds of uh, uh, difficulties. These, you know, some of these obesity, inflammatory processes, um, and, and some psychological things seem to be implicated in this. Um, now, here's a cool thing, because, you know, it's sort of like, oh, I'm going to change everything I eat. Here's another thing he did, is he gave people a glass of fresh squeezed orange juice. So fresh squeezed orange juice. It's got a little bit of fiber in it. It's got these, you know, flavonoids and, you know, various kinds of things. It moderated that um, uh, inflammatory effect. Just, just adding a glass of orange juice, still eating this, like, crap breakfast. There are small, I say this because there are small things you can do that can make a difference. Just small things. That's all I'm asking. Good nutrition equals good mental health. You know, good health, including mental health. You know, eat real food. Move your body. We are not made, you know, to like sit. You know, and if you're thinking, you know, no, it's too hard. I mean, you know, you can, you know, little kids can do it. Look at this woman up here. She's like 90 years old or something. And, you know, she, you know, you can find her. Just look up like granny yoga on, uh, you know, Google and you'll find all kinds of pictures of her doing just crazy stuff, right? You know, we know that exercise is good medicine for depression, anxiety, psychosis. It changes stress response. It changes mood. Uh, alertness, especially important for people who are on medication. So some medications for like psychosis cause people to get metabolic syndrome. So it's particularly important, you know, for people who are on medications to pay attention to this, right? Why? Well, there's some thought that it increases blood flow to the brain and blood flow to the brain is like a good thing. Right? Um, it has an influence on the HPA axis. That's the one you'll read about when you look at anxiety. Uh, influences the limbic system, the amygdala, hippocampus, motivation, mood, memory. Next one. S sleep, you know. There's a nice piece um, uh, John Hamilton did just the other day that it turns out that when you sleep, um, your neurons actually shrink and the flow of cerebral spinal fluid just goes, ramps up. And so you've just got like this, you know, wash of cerebral spinal fluid pumping through your brain um, uh, as you sleep, and it's washing out these toxins in, in uh, you know, that accrue in your brain during your hard-thinking days, right? You don't sleep, the toxins just accrue, right? Less sleep, less washing, right? Clean your brain. A nice piece, uh, I believe this was, yeah, in the New York Times the other day, diagnosing the wrong deficit. <clears throat> you know, there's a good question, which is how much ADHD is a product of sleep problems, right? Um, uh, there's just a huge overlap between sleep disturbance and ADHD. So if you look at ADHD, you find sleep disturbance. Um, you can precipitate something that looks like ADHD just by sleep depriving people. I mean, you get what people are like when you sleep deprive them. Their, your attention starts getting wonky, you know, memory, they, you know, lose where they're at, and, right? Now, I'm not saying that's the only cause, but you know, we know that sleep contributes to the very symptoms that they're trying to treat in uh, uh, ADHD. Like, look at these numbers. Ask the population, how many of you get 
less than seven hours, fewer than seven hours of sleep a day. In 1960, only 2% of the population said that they got fewer than seven hours of sleep a night. In 2011, 35% of the population, 35% are getting fewer than seven hours of sleep a night. And we know that this is toxic. Like, we're not made to not get, you know, to get that little sleep. <clears throat> and just because you can do it, doesn't make it a good idea. Now, myself, I spent like 30 years sleeping about four or five hours a night. You know, people ask me, I'd say, yeah, you know, I mean, I'd like to sleep more, but, you know, I don't seem to need it. You know, I'd sleep four or five hours. I'd wake up at, you know, three o'clock in the morning. I'd like, you know, get my laptop out and, you know, I'd just start working. I'd go the whole next day and then I'd do it again and again and again and again. I did that for like, you know, 25 years. I started reading the data on this and it says even those people who can get by on just a little sleep, get by bed or on more sleep. I put myself to bed for uh, eight and a half hours a night. That's my target. Now, I don't, always, I don't always make my target, but I'll tell you what, I got my sleep data for three and a half years. I'm, I'm closing in on it. And I'm, I'm a cop about my sleep, man. I don't let people interfere with my sleep. I need it. I mean, you can just see all these things. You can actually die from being deprived of sleep long enough. Right? It's critical. Now, you have to say, well, what has changed? Right? And well, like I'm proposing that there's something big that has changed even fairly recently. Right? You know, what has changed? Well, how about this one? A TV in every room, a computer everywhere, you know, and I mean everywhere that people are. Like, how many kids are like laying in their bedrooms you know, like this, and when they're doing that, they're not sleeping, right? And what is the effect of chronic sleep deprivation on a developing brain? I mean, do you get sleep deprivation leaves toxins in your brain? What is the effect of that over a year, two years, three years, five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years? Can it be remedied? Hell, I don't know, but I'll tell you what, I'm doing the best I can with, you know, this particular you know, case of sleep deprivation, decades long, right? Among children, this really uh, concerns me, right? Next one, engage in meaningful activity, right? I talked to you a while back about Viktor Frankl, you know, in the death camps, you know, in Nazi Germany, this was like the difference between the guys who stayed alive and the people who laid down and died. If it was good for Viktor Frankl in the death camp, I'm saying, you know, I'm willing to say it's good for us here. And there's actually a science of this starting to develop, you know, that suggests that how we respond to hardship matters. If you respond with avoidance, um, it makes you sick. You know, it reduces quality of life. If you respond with meaningful engagement in your life, it's, it's health promoting. So no matter how hard the circumstances, engagement in things that matter to you makes a difference, you know. And it doesn't have to be big things, you know. It could be swimming with your wife, you know. Or it could be riding bikes with your kids and seeing how far you can stretch her arm out for that great selfie, you know. Or it could be like helping a little girl put her shoes on. Isn't she beautiful? I love that child. She's one of my graduate students' babies. All right. Do something small every day that matters to you. Every day. Mindfulness is a modern world uh, antidote. Right? There's a great book by uh, Sapolsky called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. You know, zebras don't get ulcers. Right? Why not? Well, you know, if a lion comes out, then the zebras are like, you know, ah, you know, and they like run away, run away, run away. And then if they run, either they get eaten, and then it's no problem. Stress response, no problem. Maybe makes the meat taste bad for the lion. But, you know, it's no problem for the zebra. Or they get away. And if they get away, now there's no more lion. It's sort of like, whoa, life without lions. It's like so chill, isn't it? You know, <laughs> let's have a little drink, eat a little grass, you know. Life is good. Lion comes back. Stress response ramps up, you know, adrenaline pumps into their system, they dump their bowels, digestion stops. I mean, do you get all the things that happen? 
uh, under a circumstance of stressors. You know, cortisol is dumping into the system. Now, these things are not like bad. These things make, you know, you know, because if there's a lion, who cares about digestion? Doesn't matter. So your bowels dump, you know. Uh, digestion stops. Like all these processes stopping and all of these really, you know, chemicals are dumping into your body to make it so that you can fight or run fast and hard and that'll let you survive. Those things are not a problem, but persistently having those things go on, that makes you sick. As a matter of fact, some of the animal models are, you know, chronically stressing. Only human beings, you know, you could be like laying in your king size bed at night in your like perfectly temperatured, you know, sort of house with a refrigerator like full of food, laying in bed next to someone who loves you. And you could be like, oh, what if that happens? You know, what if the shoot goes bad tomorrow? You know, what if I end up looking like an idiot? What if she puts me in this like documentary, you know, and I sound like a jerk or, or I make a mistake on some fact and then somebody says, oh, that Wilson doesn't know what he's... <laughs> You know, it's like the lion might as well be in bed with me instead of my wife, you know, right? Only human beings, right? Every other creature on the planet, they'd be like, oh, this is nice. Down comforter, awesome, right? We got to find a place where we come to rest. And so I recommend mindfulness as a modern antidote to this, you know, piece of equipment between our e ears that can generate like a lion laying next to us in a you know, king-sized bed in the middle of the night where there are no lions. I mean, we've killed all the lions off. There's really great data on the benefits of mindfulness. Medium effect sizes on just general uh, samples, big effect sizes on people who are actually suffering from anxiety uh, and depression. Nice stuff. Now, my favorite mindfulness practice is yoga. It's sort of a moving mindfulness practice. And uh, with yoga, you can get that move your body plus mindfulness like at the same time, which is like really efficient. Uh, no, I'm not supposed to think about efficiency in yoga, but you know, there it is. I love me some yoga. Cultivate your social network. This is from Thich Nhat Hanh. I'm not trying to convert you into anything. I'm not anything that could be converted to. If you look at my Facebook page, under religious, you know, status, it says densely ambiguous. So I don't know how to convert you to that. Uh, and I wouldn't have any interest in it. I think all of the great spiritual traditions teach us like how to be in this world and to be with others in kindness. You know, that is, is a message that is in them all. Here's Thich Nhat Hanh, has a little center out in Batesville of all places. You are like a candle. Imagine you're sending light out all around you. All your words, your thoughts, your actions are going in many directions. If you say something kind, your kind words go in many directions and you yourself go with them. We're transforming and continuing in a different form at every moment. Do you get like what this means? Now, this kind of sounds, you know, kind of, some guy, Eastern karma, yeah. but there's actually a science of this, right? So this guy Christakis looks at social networks, and so this is a smoking social network in 1971. Each circle is a person in the network, and each line is a connection between these persons. So you can see there are some people who have, you know, very few connections, and some people who have like really a lot of connections. And it turns out, if you know um, how many connections and the density, like do the people I know know each other, that kind of density of the network allows you to predict things. So this one predicts smoking. And so the green balls are non-smokers, the yellow balls are smokers, and the bigger the ball, the bigger, the, the more cigarettes smoked a day. And do you see how they cluster up? how the yellow ones kind of cluster together and the green ones sort of cluster together. It turns out that you can predict four nodes out. So if I know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who smokes, you can actually predict whether I will smoke, even though I don't know this one or that one or that one. I mean, it's like amazing. Now, here's, here's the good news is, is that we've had this kind of public health campaign you know, since the 1960s. And so there's a smoking network now. It looks like a little better network to be in, huh? I mean, if you had to raise your children in one of these networks, wouldn't you choose that one? 
you know, because they're a lot less likely to smoke. And we know, like, like the probability your children will smoke has to do with whether you smoke or not. It's the number one predictor. But it turns out, like, you know, like here's a happiness network. See, this is the same thing that Thich Nhat Hanh is saying, is it means like you're influenced by, you know, the community around you and you influence them. Now, I'm not an epidemiologist uh, or an anthropologist, so I'm a psychologist, and so I work with people one at a time or little groups like us. And see, I want to influence you. See, we have a little social network like right here. And so there are two things that I ask people. I like to ask people. I ask clients this, and I ask you. You know, I beg you to think about this. What are you doing for your social network? So you think about the people you're connected to. And it's like a garden. You know, and we tend that garden. And maybe it's just a call or a text or a, I just wanted you to know I was thinking about you today. Or, uh, you know, hey, you know, let's go out for coffee this afternoon. Just, just small things that keep people connected. And then the other thing is what are you putting into the network? You know, if you're like sarcastic in the network, guess what happens? If you're vitriolic, you know, if you're mean. But what happens if you're kind? Well, if you're kind, then you're a little more likely to be kind to her, and she's a little more likely to be kind to him. And he knows people that she doesn't even know, and he's a little more likely to be kind to her. We can do something about this, like today, like right now. And there's like a super cool science of this. It turns out that this social environment actually turns off and on, you know, some of the, uh, you, you know, your, your genes. Like th they're actually moving uh, every moment. And this social impact has a huge impact on that. Cool guy, Stephen Cole, in an interview with David Dobbs uh, in The Verge. This is what a cell is about. A cell, he said, is a machine for turning experience into biology. Every day as your cells die off, we have to replace one or two percent of our molecular being. We're constantly building and re-engineering new cells, and that re-engineering is driven by contingent, the contingent nature of genetic expression. Do you see what he's saying there? Is that, is that your genes aren't just like doing the same thing no matter what. What you're pouring into your system every day matters. He says, your experiences today will influence your molecular composition, like what your genes are coding for. Your experience today will affect the molecular composition of your body for the next two to three months, or perhaps for the rest of your life. Plan your day accordingly. Right? Now, we don't have to wait. Right? And there's a l plenty of evidence that small changes, just small changes in any of these, you know, can make a difference in the quality of our lives. Now, does this seem like too much? It's like too hard? You know, you can do something small today. So I want to show you. So if you're thinking, oh, it's too hard. Um, I can't, I can't do that. And I want you to like check this out. Oh, what are you doing? sent me those first two pictures on with the knee braces the back brace the canes 297 pounds and his belly was out to here and I was thinking god how am I gonna help that guy when you get what you want not what you need 
When you feel so tired that you can't sleep Stuck in reverse And tears come streaming down your face When you lose something you can't replace when you love someone but it goes to waste Could it be worse? Lights will go You And it I have lost so much weight that if I don't hold these up they'll fall and I'm not gonna do that right now But I'm really pleased with this, and I just want to share this with everybody. Thanks a lot. When you're too in love to let it go, but if you never try, you'll never know. Here's where I'm at now. Just what you wear. Just give me one more minute here. We can do something. I said there was going to be a happy ending. Am I right? We can do something. You know, it's in our hands. And so we'll close out um, with the world's... This is Anne Frank. She spent the last few years of her life sealed up in like a box um, in uh, Amsterdam because she was Jewish and the Nazis, you know, wanted to kill every Jew on the planet. And shut away in like this little box, you know, hidden away from the world. This is what this little girl said. You know, she, you see, she only, she died in 1945. She was only 16 years old. She said, how wonderful it is that nobody need wait a single moment before beginning to improve the world. We can do something about it. You're not broken. The people around you are not broken until they're shown to be broken. And even if they're broken, they're going to be better off if we're taking care of one another. That's it.